What up, everybody? Welcome to the stream here on a Friday night. My name is Paul Abernathy. Welcome to another episode of Coffee Hour with Paul. Glad you could join me. Those that are joining me wherever you are in the country, thanks for joining me on this episode. Um, tonight, we're going to do a little bit of talking about exam preparation and prepared. And, and all this is leading up to our 2023 edition of the Fast Tracks coming out here in the next couple weeks. And we're excited. Um, obviously, publications here, um, and we're ready for it to ready for it to be released and ready. Doing a couple of fine tuned tweaks here at the end, uh, but we're going to be ready for it. So, I've um, got a lot of videos planned uh, for the 2023 edition, but don't worry, we're going to cover the 2020 at the same time, so it's all good. But uh, yeah, we're real excited about all that coming out. It's been a couple years now since we came out with the 2020 edition of the Fast Track. So uh, we're excited about that. But tonight's not about that. Tonight we're going to talk exam preparation and uh, give you the, the opportunity to uh, be able to uh, ask, answer questions, uh, talk about how we dissect a question, do a couple questions. It is live. Um, and I want to also want to make an effort at showing you what you do when you're using some exam prep questions and you you get something wrong. Um, and I want to show you what I recommend you do if you get it wrong and how you would address that. OK, so we're going to talk about that tonight as well. Um, and then and I also want to mention a couple of things that that uh, uh, that you can do that can also help you if you are preparing for an electrical exam. And, and one of those uh, key things that you can do is if you don't have, and you might be scared to do this, again, I know what they say all over the place, and I also did this, uh, TikTok. Um, you know, um, I'm getting a little more trusting of that weird little platform. Um, we don't do a lot of stuff on that, but I did want to tell you about uh, a show that's that's a, a kind of a, a series that, that Jay's doing over on TikTok. So, uh, if you're interested in doing some Q&A uh, and answering questions using our database, um, then you can go over and uh, go to TikTok when Jay does some of his, his live streams. And you can do that on some of his live streams. So that kind of makes it uh, pretty cool because he'll actually uh, show questions on the screen as well. And y'all can interact and, and try to answer the questions and things like that. So. Uh, make sure you don't forget to do that. It's the, the Basement King or Basement King 12, I believe. But you'll find them. Just go hunting for Jay Grunberg over there on the TikTok platform and, and get into uh, some of that stuff that he does over there. He's a, he's a big TikToker. He loves that TikTok stuff. So uh, check that out. Now, we also are on TikTok. So make sure you look us up um, at Fast Tracks System. Um, but again, I think you could probably find me if you hunt for master the NEC, I'm sure you'll find us over there as well. So, uh, but anything like that. So, uh, at any rate, want to make sure that you check that out. Okay. So we're going to look at some questions tonight. 
and we're going to kind of talk about dissecting them and you try to answer them. And again, feel free to, to give your answers in the com in the in your uh, chat feature. Uh, I'm able to see chat from all the platforms. So whatever platform you happen to be watching in, feel free to uh, go ahead and, and uh, type in what you think the answer is. And uh, if you got your code books, let's get into it a little bit. Okay, so I'm going to go on and get over into the question here and kind of jump into the to the very first question in our segment here. And I'm going to do something while I'm doing this real quick, guys. I want to uh, kind of, let's see here, hold on for a second. I want to, if I can't get us a little bit more real estate on this question here. Okay, we'll see how that works out. All right. All right, so here's the first question you have on the screen. You feel free to comment if you know the answer. Um, and I will kind of show you how I would dissect this question if I was in an exam environment. Okay, so the question is storage batteries used as a source of power for emergency systems, ding, ding, ding. When you see something that makes reference to emergency systems, you got to get used to, you know, you can go in the back of the, the, the index and you can start searching for trigger words, emergency systems, storage batteries, batteries. There's many ways that you could take some of these keywords and start looking at the index. But what I want you to get used to is being able to look at a question. And if you put in the right time and you studied properly, then if you put in the right time, you'll be able to notice that when it says storage batteries used as a source of power for uh, emergency systems, you should immediately start thinking Article 700, right? Because that's emergency systems. You start thinking about those aspects of it, right? You've got uh, so many things to think about. It's emergency system 700, 701, 702. Okay, so you've got emergency, you've got legally required, and then you got optional. So you start thinking about all of those things. So this question's about emergency systems, and it's very specific to storage batteries. So those should be your triggers, okay? Now, I tell people this all the time on an exam. If you know this question right off the bat, and you already know the answer to it, and you don't need to do any study, you know, looking up anything, you just know the answer, well, go ahead and mark it and go on. It's that first wave. So let's talk a little bit about three-wave method in preparing for an exam. The three-wave method would be that the first wave, you're going to answer what you know within a minute and just go on to the next question. If you get over a minute, approximately a minute, I know you're not really watching the clock too awful much, but if you get over a minute, then you're going to just mark it electronically, and all those systems have it so you can mark it. And then you just go on to the next question. I don't want you dwelling on a question too long. You're going to get three passes at it. The whole point of that first wave on an exam is, one, you're nervous. All right. You're, you're excited. You're in the test and you're in you know, all this excitement's going on. Uh, it's, a, it's a way to kind of calm you down, answer your question. Or if you can't answer it in a minute, you mark it, you go to the next one. I want you to finish that wave, that first wave. Go through those questions and try to answer the ones you know just without a doubt right away. You want to be able to answer them and move on. That's going to build you a repository of time. Because now on the second wave, you're going to answer the ones that you marked during the first wave. And you're going to be able to spend an additional minute or a minute and a half, depending on how long your test is. Um, and you're going to go through the second wave. And the moment you feel confident and you answer it, you're going to uncheck it, answer it, and go to the next one. So then the once you go through all that, the third wave, all you should have left is, is the checked ones. And again, any of the calcs that you skipped till the last uh, round, right? So in this case, if you knew the answer to this one, you know it's emergency systems, right? And you're looking for storage batteries. Okay, so with that said, we'll go to the NEC. Okay, we're, in the, we're over in the NEC and you see that I'm under part three sources of power and that's kind of what the question was kind of about and i noticed that my screen is also not right here so bear with me i will try to get my link a little bit more uh in tune with what we've got here so bear with me here folks i wasn't aware that i didn't have link all the way set up right bear with me i'm so used to using the other software that we use that we've been using lately that I haven't been really thinking much about this one. <laughs> it's 
So, uh, but this is our normal streaming software. So we're back to back to normal. Um, let's see here. Let me lock that down. Okay. So here we are over here, sources of power. Because if you remember the question, one of the key things to remember the question, when I'm at chapter seven and I'm in article 700, right? Then I want to make sure that I'm looking at the different parts to make sure where I, where I might need to go. So in this case, um, there is actually a part that's called sources of power, right? In, in uh, article 700. So we go there, and then what are we looking for when we're in sources of power? We're obviously bold scanning till we get down to right here, storage batteries. That's what was in the question, storage batteries. So as you can see right here, the other thing that we like to do, and we go back to the question real quick. The other thing that we like to do is since we've got that exam right in front of us, right? that we use the answers to help us as we're bold scanning. So we, we knew it was emergency systems, and we know we're looking for batteries, uh, storage batteries in emergency systems. I'm bold scanning out, and that's where I saw storage batteries. And it's, it is exactly as somebody says in the chat, Cameron, it is one and a half hours. Absolutely. So we can go on and mark that. And continue. And as you can see, that is correct. And I scroll down, and there you can see it's 700.12c, and that's where we're at. Uh, another thing to remember about our course, though, if those that are in the fast tracks, that if you're in the 2020, it's also going to give you the 2017 reference. Uh, when the 2023 comes out in a couple weeks, it's going to give the 20 references. So it's going to give the 2023 and the 2020. And that's important, folks, because there was some serious changes between the 2020 and the 2023, okay? So, type of things. Uh, let's see here, what do we got? Joe says, are, any, are there any heat tracing questions in the master's exam? I, you know, who knows? Is it fair game? Maybe. Um, there's no way anybody knows everything that's on these exams because it's coming from a pool of about, each state, I know in Texas, it's about 2,500 question pool. But if it's in the NEC, then it's game. Okay? It's always game to be on the exam. So that's why you want to be prepared or at least know where you go to find the answer, that type of thing. Okay? So it's always potentially game. So be prepared for that. All right, let's go on to the next one. Okay, let's see here. Okay, the next question is a given question. Okay. Uh, my email is a dead link. My email is not a dead link, my friend. So uh, uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that. If you're contacting us from the website, then it's a form you fill out. So there is no link. It's just a form you fill out and you cl click the submit button. Other than that, I've been getting emails, so I don't know anything about a dead link. Um, all right. So given an existing metal junction box has a volume of 24 cubic inches and contains a total of six. Okay, so we're gonna have to do a little work here. Has a total of six size 12 AWG wires. Okay, so what do we got? It's existing, okay, so it's 27 cubic inch. See if you can work this one out, guys, and let me know what you think. So it's 27 cubic inches, that's the metal box. It's already there. And it already contains six. Okay, six size 12 AWGs. So it already has six 12 AWGs in there. Okay, now additional wires, uh, additional wires of size 10 need to be added to the box. Okay, so no grounding, no grounding conductors, devices, or fittings are contained in this box. Okay, so that makes it somewhat easier because now we're looking at an existing box. Oh, by the way. If you got this one on an exam, you are going to mark this one and skip it. You're going to save this for the wave where you build up your time so that you don't have to feel so, so stressed at trying to answer this question. Okay. Uh, again, you got a little amount of time on the exam, so you want to save these. Unless you just know, then that's, that's one thing. But we want to take the time. But we're going to go on and solve it. Okay. So we got 27 cubic inches. We've got six 12s that are already in there. 
And we have additional wires, a size 10 need to be added to the box, no ground conductors to consider. Uh, devices and fittings are, are con uh, contained in the box, so none of that's in the box. What is the maximum number of size 10 conductors that may, that, that may be added to this box? Okay, cool, okay. So when I'm seeing a question like this, I know that we're dealing with box fill. Now we already been given the 27 cubic inches, so that's good. The next, we need to find out what the cubic inch is of a 12 gauge, okay? And then we need to find out what the cubic inches are of a 10 gauge. Now, where do we go to find that information? Since we've been given the box and we've been told that it's 27 cubic inches, we're gonna go to the code now. So I'm over in the code and I'm gonna go to box fill. Okay, 314. And if you remember, it's 314.16. And that's where we deal with the, the box fill. All right. So we're going to go down and here's the allowance for conductors. And I'll expand this out so you can see this here. All right. So this is what we have. And so we can see that a 12, right, is 2.25 cubic inches. So I'm going to write that down. And then the tens are 2.50, so 2.50. So they're the ones we're going to add. So taking our calculator, and we're going to get rid of those, those six up front. We need to have know how many of those six mean. So we're going to 2.25 times six, and that is 13.50 cubic inches, okay? Double check yourself, 2.25 times six, 13.5 cubic inches, all right? Now, we need to see how many tens we can put in there, but currently we need to take that 27 cubic inches, which is what the box was, we need to take that 13.5 away from it, okay? So we're gonna do 27, I'm gonna minus 13.50, and that gives me 13.50 cubic inches remaining. Okay, so, at that point, we know it's 13.50 remaining. We know that the cubic inches for the 10 gauge was 2.50, correct? Right? So what we're going to do is we're going to take that 13.50 and we're going to divide that by 2.50 and it's 5.4, okay? All right, so that means that 5.4 can go in there so we're going to be at, we can put five more in there. All right, so let's get rid of this. And let's see if we can go back to our code question. And we're at our code question and we're gonna just click five. Correct. So now do you see the logic train that we did here, how we got this, right? So again, we went here and we knew that the cubic inch, where is it at, excuse me, right here. The cubic inch for 12 was 2.25, and we had six of them. That gave us 13.5. We got that. We took that 27, which was what was given to us in the question. We took away that 13.5 because we need to see what's remaining, right? We need to see what's extra. And then once we had that 13.5, then all we had to do was take that 13.5, right, and divide it by 2.5 cubic inches to see what the remaining was, and we saw that it was 5.4. Well, you can't have 0.4 of a conductor. So we dropped the 0.4, and it's basically five tens. So I can add five 10 gauges to that box, okay? You see how we did that? Um, that's important one, because that kind of chain question is very common on an exam, kind of where it links together like that, and you just simply, um, have to, to work it out piece by piece, just like we did, okay? Again, this is covered extensively in our program, but for those out there that are not in a structured program, you really need to, to take your time and really focus on how these questions are answered, just like that, okay? So, all right, let's go another one. All right, next question we got on our screen. It says, the NEC, hey, Michael, welcome. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, let's see, the NEC considers the area around the outdoor 
motor fuel dispensing pumps at a motor fuel service station to be a hazardous location. This area extends a height of 18 inches above grade and up to a distance from the enclosure of the fuel dispensing pump of blank feet. Okay, so what we're looking at here is we're at the pump. Okay, so it's a motor fuel dispensing pump. And we're looking at what the zone is for this, this hazardous location. So it's up 18 inches, but it extends out how many feet? Okay, so it says in the question, it says the, the area extends a height of 18 inches above grade, okay, and up, to a, uh, and up to a distance from the enclosure to the fuel dispensing pump of blank feet, okay? Okay, so indexes can become important. Um, I'm not able to show an index because NFPA did away with indexes uh, unless you have the actual book yourself in your hand. So I encourage you to get used to, that's not showing up, get, encourage you to get used to using your code book and using the index to be able to look things up uh, in it because fuel dispensing, you'd be able to look up fuel dispensing. Uh, you probably can look under hazardous locations, uh, those type of things. Those are all triggers, uh, fuel dispensing pumps, hazardous locations. Uh, what else would be something in there? Um, of course, you can also go to the, the table of contents, right? And if you go to the table of contents, what's your code reference there? Uh, Fabrice, give me a code reference to support that answer, and we'll go look. Um, and then, again, at the end of the day, you could go to the table of contents. The table of contents, if you go to table of contents, and you go looking in it here, and I'll go looking, um, you're going to look here and see, okay, so where am I? at in looking up the different things. Let's look up, let me look up a little bit here with y'all. You got a code reference, feel free to pop it, pop it in there. And let's see, so we got different fuel, uh, motor fuel dispensing facilities. We have that in Article 514. So, Probably a good place. Now, if I was looking at the index in the back of the book, interesting enough, let me see if there is something under fuel. This fuel dispensing, maybe. Uh, now, this is something that I'll share with you that I share with my students all the time when we do our Wednesday night sessions. Taking your time on a question allows you, while you're in the study phase, to dissect the question and use the index to try to find all the possible ways that you could find the answer. Now, obviously, it's getting harder for me these days because my glasses suck and I can hardly see the daggone code book anymore anyway. But we want to look and see what you might have in the back. So, OK, I don't see anything for fuel dispensing. Uh, let's see. It might be something else, but. I'm going to also look at, uh, let's see here, one of my other ones that I'm going to look at would be um, hazardous locations. So I'm going to look into just under hazardous location. Now, why do we use the index? Now, you might already know that the easiest thing might be to simply uh, go to the, the table of contents, go to 514, and start bolt scanning, and use the answers to help you with your bolt scanning the 18, and then it's going to correspond with a, another reference in feet. And that might get you there as well, okay, if you want to do bold scanning technique. So I like to look and see what all is in the table of contents for a reason. Again, if anybody ever tells you out there, there you go, February. If anybody out there tells you that it's when you're doing exam questions and it's all about time, you need to find a different instructor because they're lying to you and they're not worth their salt, okay? You worry about timing yourself. You worry about speed in the last two to three weeks before your exam. During your study phase, if you got a good set of questions, you want to dissect the hell out of them. You want to look at all the possible words in there, key phrases that could get you somewhere in the index in case you struggle. If you already know the answer, you mark it, you move on. 
But if you struggle, you find yourself struggling with lookup questions, that's something I can give advice to people is take your time and take, even if it takes you 10 minutes a question, dissect it, right? Dissect it. You'll get better at it. Trust me. All right. So when I'm looking in here also, let's see, let me go look under hazardous locations and y'all can do it too. I'm kind of basically letting you into kind of the insides of some of the stuff that we do on um, uh, Wednesday nights. You know, lately we've been doing some classes, but here, let's kind of see what we've got under hazardous locations. Let's see what we got. Hazardous locations. Let's see. Class, how does it classify locations? And let's go on down a little bit. And let's see what we got here. Okay. Gasoline service stations. And it says, see, motor fuel dispensing facilities. Okay. So... Maybe we didn't we didn't we did fuel dispensing, but we didn't do motor. So you'll forever remember that fuel pump dispensing is under motor fuel pump dispensing. Okay. You might say, Paul, I already knew that. Well, good for you. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I'm gonna look under motor fuel and see what it's talking about under here. All right, so motor fuel dispensing. I'm gonna go down. And see what we've got here, if anything helps us. Okay. Classification of locations. Okay. Under motor fuel. So 514.3. Now, we're going to go there. But again, you could have gone right to 514 and you could have bold scanned looking for these answers. And that would have been another method to do it. So, but the dissecting method, that's what you want to use if you're in the study phase. I mean, you probably paid for your question, your code questions. If you're in the fast tracks, you got over 800 of them. Make them useful. Take your time. You'd be surprised how many of these questions or similar ones will appear on the exam. Okay. So let's go on over to the code. We've dissected that one enough. So you might have gone to the index and gone to 514. And I'll tell you something else about that. Uh, why, when you should bold scan, when would be the best time to bold scan? Well, check this out. 514 is not big. So when you start learning the different articles, you'll learn which are small and it behooves you to simply do what? Just go straight to the actual article and start bold scanning. And what are you using as your bold scan trigger? You're using the question and the answers to do that. Right. So here's the classification of locations right here. Right. And you can see here's that, that there's that 18 inches. And this is just a, this is just the figure, by the way. Um, but if you go down classification of locations, right? And you get you have tons of information down here. Um, and of course, I will show you this. This just happens to be on the right side here, right? You see this information in here. So this is talking about the dispenser. Right. This is the, the, the pump itself. Right. And you got the dispenser right here. Right. And of course, dispenser, you scroll over. And you see everything right here. So it's 18 inches at the dispenser. And then it says here, since the question was about outdoors, right? it was an outdoor motor fuel dispensing fuel dispensing pump. So you go to the outdoors. So this is in the dispenser. This is the outdoors of the dispenser. And if you scroll over, it says 18 inches above grade, extending 20 feet horizontal in all directions. Of course, you could have looked at the illustration too, uh, but all of that's there. So leave it at that one. And we'll come back real quick. All right. And we got our answer. We'll just click 20 and let's see what, how it works. And there you go, 514.3B1. And you'll notice it did not change for the 2017 or the 2020. So same code reference uh, there as well. Very good. But that's how we dissect it out. Okay, and you did a great job. All of you seem to get that answer and dissected it out well. All right, next question. All right, looks like we got a, a, a lot of semi kind of calc things today so far. So, all right. 
Let's look at this one. Where an 80 ampere, 240 volt single phase load is located 200 feet from the panel board and is supplied with a size three AWG copper conductor with THHN, THWN insulation. What is the approximate voltage drop on the circuit? And of course, this is telling you that you're gonna use absolute K as 12.9, okay? So 12.9 is what you would use for copper, all right? So that is the approximate K, and that's gonna be acceptable. 21.2 for aluminum, 12.9 for copper. So one of the things we have to think about here is we have to remember, um, we, we have to remember the, the formulas for voltage drop. Now, let me, let me tell you something. Voltage drop in the code is only a requirement for sensitive electronic equipment and for fire pumps. Everywhere else, okay, everywhere else, it is basically um, just a recommendation. So the 3% for the branch, 2% for the feeder, or 3% for the feeder, 2% for the branch. Overall, not more than, the, together, not more than 5%, but we, we're focusing on questions about the branch circuit, we typically use the 3%. Um, and remember, in a voltage drop calculation, you never use 3%. You use the actual voltages that's dropped, right? Like 3.6 volts for uh, 120, you just simply just take 120 times 3%, and it's 3.6. So that's the actual volts, right? So that's what you would use. Uh, we have something here from Van Man. Let's see here, it says, greetings from Omaha, Nebraska, Union Electrician, and I recently found your channel. You're a great instructor. Well, thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, you dumb it down well, <laughs> you're most welcome. I, you know, it's, code can be an interesting topic anyway for people, so we try to just make it as, as easy to understand as possible, no sense overcomplicating something. And I learn every day too, and I just still, after 30 some years, I still enjoy doing it, so. Must be something to it. Um, trying to pass my California. Got any videos on that? Um, not. We don't have any videos that would that I say are specific to California. The only thing I can tell you about California is even though they might be under Title 17 or something like that, they uh, it's basically still based on the National Electrical Code. So study the NEC. All of our fast tracks programs work fine for California. We have plenty of people that have passed the exam in California. Um, they do have some quirky things, uh, but usually just having that document is all you need. Uh, most of the stuff is going to be based on the NEC, and it's going to be common sense. I mean, California is kind of way out there, but they, they don't do too many things beyond the NEC, okay, when it comes to their electrician's exams. So you shouldn't have any problem with it. Um, the other thing about it is I believe California is, is a uh, uh, closed book type of thing, so I can't remember, but... That means that most of the stuff on there should be common sense driven. Uh, they can't expect you to remember everything. So, um, but all I can tell you is the students that we have, when you go through the Fast Tracks program, um, you learn so much about code that it makes those, code, those tests like that so much easier. That's all I can say about that. Okay? Okay. Uh, Swartzy's, Swartzy's then, then throwing up a formula. Shh, Swartzy, what are you doing? You're always accusing me. Shh. All right, so what do we got in the, in the equation? Okay, so we're doing a voltage drop equation. It's typically, this is single phase, so you know that it's two times K, which is the constant, in our case, 12.9, right, times the amps, and we already know the amps, it's 80 amps, and the distance is 200 feet. Now, in this case, we, aren't, we already know what the conductor size is. If we didn't know what the conductor size is, we would take all that and we would dot, divide that by what? If we didn't know the conductor size, then we would divide that by the actual voltage drop, okay? Which in this case, with 3.6, if it's a 120, it's 7.2 if it's a 240. In this case, we're given the conductor size. So we use that same formula. That's one thing to remember about voltage drops. Once you understand the core formulas, you can mix them around a little bit and you'll still be okay, right? Um, so in this case, we are given the conductor. So before we even start mapping this out and writing anything down and jotting it down, we do need to go find out what the circular mill is for that three gauge copper, okay? So we're gonna go to the code and do that real quick. 
So you know where to do this if you're doing voltage drop. So we're going over here to the code and we're gonna go down and we're gonna to go to chapter nine and we're gonna go to table eight. I can get it right the first time here. Could, uh, nope, I didn't it, there it is right there. All right, I'm gonna blow this out for you so you can see it, it's kind of hard to see it, but uh, I'll go down to where it is. So as I don't want to readjust the screen for this, this one here for you. So, um, so what we need to do is three. Three is going to be right here. Okay. This one is three. If you've got your code book. You can look it up. That's 52,620. So write that down. 52,620 circular mills. Okay. Now remember, where do we get circular mills? Right here. We're doing area circular mills. It's chapter nine, table eight. That's where we're going to go to get circular mills. Now, remember, when it's 250 kC mill and up, you already know what it is, right? If it's 250, the conductors are 250 kC mill, 250 K being 1,000, so you could take the 250 times 1,000, or you just know that the K is 1,000, so 250 kC mill would be 250,000. 300 kC mill would be 300,000. Well, you, know, you get the deal, right? So anyway, when you start getting smaller, 4 out and less, then you're going to have to come here and actually get the area. Okay, so in our case, we got it, and it was 52,620, right? Done deal. Okay, so now we can kind of come back to the question and work this thing. All right, now remember the formula, okay? 2 times K times I times D divided by the circular mill, which was 52,620. So let's, let's plug all this in and see what you got, all right? Nobody's given me an answer yet, even though the formula is in the chat room, and I think it's in the YouTube side of the chat room. Um, I don't even know if we're streaming on our Facebook page, to be honest with you, because it acted weird tonight. So I don't know if it is streaming on it or not. So somebody let me know if you're on Master the NEC on Facebook. Uh, let me know if it's streaming on there. Okay, so let's do the math here. Somebody's already given us, given us an answer, and we'll see, we'll see how that works out. Okay, so two... Okay, got some more answers here. Very good. Two times, yep, Facebook. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate that. Two times K, which is 12.9, times what do we got? The I, which is amps, that's 80, times how many feet? 200. Equals 412,800, right? Divided by. 52,620 is 7.84. All right, did you all figure you all figured it out? Looks like people in the chat room got it all figured out. Now, again, I will tell you, this is one of those ones, again, when you're doing the three-wave method. If you haven't watched my video on three-wave, please do, um, because it kind of reduces the stress sitting in front of a test. Uh, go and answer all the questions you can answer right away. Those that give you more than one minute, you're going to mark it and go into the next round. Spend another minute to minute and a half once you go through them again. If you still can't answer it, leave it checked. If you answer it, uncheck it and go to the next question. Skip the math and save them to the end. Unless you're in a master's exam where it has like Texas, which has two separate tests. They have a lookup, code lookup, and then they have a calculation. This, the process still works for, cal for the calcs, uh, but again, it's just that process. Three waves, three waves. That's how you're going to do it. All right, so we're going to answer this one right here. And there it is, correct. There's the formula. You see right there, you see the math. Two times 12.9 times 80 times 200 divided by the circular mills. Now, let me tell you a little bit. If this was three phase, for example, then instead of using a two, you all know you're going to use 1.732, which is the square root of three, okay? Because you have three legs, three phase, okay? So anyway, that's, that's what you got. So if you had the same question and it was three phase, right, then what you're going to do is you're going to, now, the, the voltages and everything like that, when you plug it in, um, you're going to have that voltage value is going to be given, but you're going to use the same kind of variables. Just remember, three phase, use 1.732, okay? That's about all you're going to get from that on an exam. All right. Next question. Okay, doing great, by the way. What's up, Fabrice? You're in PA. The issue is I have is the calculations 
on the dwelling units. Yeah, absolutely. So we actually have a very extensive video series on dwelling unit calculations. The problem is, I'm sorry, Fabrice, I don't really do those things for free anymore. Um, that is available in our Fast Tracks Tube. Okay, Fast Tracks Tube is where we would have that extensive video, and it's well worth it if that's where you struggle at. Okay, so all right. Let's see here. Let's go to the next one. Class three single conductors used as other wiring within a building shall not be smaller than blank and shall be type CL3. Okay. What do you think? So let's see here. If you were dissecting this question, we have class three single conductors. All right. So class three tells me that now this is an interesting one because in the 2023 code, this is going to be totally out of where you would, would normally think this is to be. Okay. But again, this is being the 2020. We're using the 2020 for this one here. Okay. So class three single conductors, where do you think that would be? So it's used as other wiring within a building. Okay. Well, anybody have any ideas where this might be? Okay, class three. All right, so let's go see what we can do. Oh, this is a, this would be a great one to show you what to do and how to, what happens if you get it wrong on an exam? I mean, on a question. So I said I was going to do that at the beginning, so this is a good one for that. We'll go on and find it, but I want you to, to know, if you're doing practice questions and you're, 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 you found a good collection of them, whether you're using our system or not, you get one wrong, don't freak out. Really, don't freak out because you can actually use the answer to re-engineer and look up the question and then look at all of the words, okay? There you go, Cameron, you're on it. Look at all of the words that are in the question and then you re-dissect it. So you remember what I say, don't waste your questions. Just because some people buy questions, 100 question exam, prep questions, and they burn through them. And they don't get the full, you don't squeeze all the life out of those questions. Because really, what, what are we doing? If all you've got is exam questions, then the frugal way to be would be to take a question and really beat it to death. Look at all the possible ways you could have found the answer for this. Okay? And that's what you want to do with it. So, okay, so everybody's saying that it's Article 725 which is remote control and uh, signaling, okay? Because that is a class three. So let's go on and go. Now, anybody's, nobody's given me the code, the, the answer yet, or the code reference, okay? But we'll go on and go down because everybody seems to want to go to 725. So we'll go there. And here you see here, I'll just go back to the code real quick. Now here you can actually see, and it's probably hard for you to see on the screen, but here you see where my mouse is. It says class one, class two, and class three, okay? Right here, all right? So I will click on that, all right? And so what we're gonna do is, if I was doing this one, I would probably, you could use the index, but I would probably bold scan this out. And I would say so there's class one, and I would probably, we're not dealing with one, so I would probably move on. Here's class two and class three, okay? So we're looking at class three. We got some answers there. Okay, I see some answers coming in. Give your code reference, all right? So we've got information, markings, okay? There you go. Now, in this case, looking, if you were bold scanning this on an exam and you knew it was in 725, what you want to do is use your answers. You know it's 14, 18, 16, or 20. So if I'm going to, here's a, here's a bold scan technique. Since I know what I'm looking for and I just happen to go to that area in the code, I'm bold scanning quickly for anywhere that I see size references. Okay? And I'm looking, looking, looking anyway because I'm, I'm remembering in my head 14, 18, 16, and 20. And I'm looking down real quick and going through sizes. Seeing if I see anything about sizes, conductor sizes, and this is what you would do if you didn't know the answer. And if you already know the answer, that's great. But if you don't, 
Okay. Then you go down and look and see what you might find for sizes. Now I don't see any sizes. I'm still looking down. Okay. Getting out of there. And there you go. Power separated. Okay. I don't see any sizes. I don't see at least any, any amp, you know, AWG sizes anywhere. Here we go down here. I don't see any. Okay. Somebody, somebody find any answer yet? Okay. And when we do this one, I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna show you what we do. If we're gonna get it. We're gonna get the answer, but we're gonna get it wrong on purpose. And I want to show you how you dissect it. All right. So, looking for sizes. Okay. I see a lot about three. Okay. Okay. Now, remember what it said in the question. This is CL three, right? So we're looking for sizes and I see tables and here's AWGs, temperatures and passes for each conductor, All right? Applications. Okay. And requirements, listing, labeling. Okay. All right, I'm still waiting for somebody to give me a code reference. Or I get to for I get to see if we can get to it before you give the code reference. Okay. All right. I'm gonna. I, I hate to stop right here, but anybody? Nobody giving us any reference yet. Uh oh, somebody did. And let's go back up here to the beginning of it to see if he's right. All right. Well, this is 725.179. The code reference I got was 154. And I think that is 154D, but then I got an H2. So let's go back up here. We have 154 A, B, C. All right, I'm in 2020 edition of the NEC. Okay. So. Going down. Class three single conductor used as the other wire within the building shall not be smaller than 18 gauge and shall be CL3. So we got the, I believe we got the 18 gauge right for two people. However, um, I'm, I'm on the 2020, so um, I'm not on the 2017, but we'll see what the answer is uh, either way. Okay, because I'm gonna answer it wrong so I can show you how we might dissect it. Um, Okay, so we know that here I use the 18 to be my bold scan, okay? Or I use the sizes to be my bold scan. And also remember it's said about class three single conductors, but the this seems like the answer for here is in 725.179, okay? For that. And so there we go. Now let's go back to the code question real quick because we've established it's 18, right? And I'm starting to get some answers now. Okay, very good. So now it would be 18. I'm going to, for craps and giggles, folks, I'm gonna just click 20. So I wanna also show you what happens in the, um, the answer, what it gives you when you get it wrong. Now we know that we should be 18, but let's see what it does here. Incorrect, there you go. So for those that are in the Fast Tracks program, the one that turns green around it is obviously the answer. But here, this says that it is 725.179H, regardless of 2017 or 2020. So I'm not sure where the 154s came from. Uh, so uh, this says, and it could be wrong, but it says that it's 179H even in the 2017. So you folks that have the 2017, Go go check it. So I'm not sure where y'all's 154H and all that were coming from because I don't believe that we have a 154H. Uh, I'll just go check. Yep, there's 154 right there. And it's an A and a B and a C and that's it. So I'm not sure where your references were coming from. But, uh, but there you go. So that was an example of how we bold scan. Now, using the answers, if you had got this wrong, you could have said, okay, here's the answer, 179. You would have backtracked to 179, and you would have looked at it and said, okay, how would I have gotten 
to this answer, this, this, this 725.179? Well, you could go to your index, okay? Go to your index, and then you go back and you look for class three. Look under class three in the index, or look under remote control, okay? Uh, all those are the ways that you would dissect it backwards now, but since you know the code reference, you're gonna go and look and see if anything under class three, under remote control, and any of that, if it's there, you're gonna see if there's any of these code references that match up, or if anything that could have put you somewhere around there, right? Uh, maybe it was under class three for single conductors. I don't know, but this is probably not the best question, because to me, this should have is an easier one. I knew the answer was 18, because I make wire and cable. But at the end of the day, there's a bold scanning can be really powerful if you use the answers and what's in the question to help trigger. But you have to be able to remember the, the conductor sizes as you're bold scanning down and then remember little elements about the, about the question. So this is why people ask me why I'm not a big fan of nothing but video training. Because I don't think you can do that right. I think you have to learn by reading it and then have it lock in your head some part of the question, right? And the answers to be able to get really good at it. So that's why I'm still a believer in the way that our Fast Tracks program does it now. A lot of reading, but it's gonna make it comprehend a little better. Just watching a video may not make it hammer home the same way that if you worked it out like that. So that's just, that's just how I like to teach it. And uh, again, I do do a lot of videos, like I'm doing a live stream tonight, but that is one of the ways I, I really do like to do it. Also, folks, I have a new camera, so let me know how the camera looks. Uh, Y'all are used to my old camera, but I do have, an, I have a new uh, higher-end camera uh, that we've added to the, to the platform. So, Because we have so many videos that are coming up here in the next couple weeks when the 2023 launches that we just revamped some systems. And that's why I have my hat down, folks, because the studio lights in this room are crazy. They are so bright that if I were to do this, I mean, it would blind me. So that's why I do that. Okay, all right. I probably should maybe put them up higher. I don't know, we'll see. All right, let's go back to the, let's, let's do another question. So that was a good one. We were able to kind of go through it and dissect it and, and look how that works. Good job. Y'all are right on it. Okay, next one. Y'all ready? Got your code books? Let's go. In regards to artificially made bodies of water. Ding, ding, ding. That there's a specific place in the code for that, right? Artificial made bodies of water. Liquid tight flexible metal conduit, LFMC, is a wiring method permitted to use for a feeder or branch circuit where flexibility is required. Which of the following listed wiring methods is also approved for this use? Ah, okay. So we're talking about artificially made bodies of water. And there's some things that you might be able to just knock off all automatically and look at it. Okay, let's we'll see here. Um, extra hard usage portable power cable. Uh, not to be a substitute for any fixed wiring. Um, UF cable, uh, TC cable, if it's direct buried. But typically, you wouldn't use TC cable exposed or uh, anything other than what's listed in 336. So that might be a process of elimination. And USE cable. Uh, so we have to look it up and see. So first things first. Artificial made bodies of water. All right. Okay. Everybody know. Anybody know what, uh, what what article that happens to be? I'll wait. I'll I'll give you. A, I'll give a little time here in the chat. See if you can come up with it. Again, this is all about you. So those that are participating, you want to join in. There we go. Very good, Schwartzy. I would expect no less. Uh, so let's go to artificial made bodies of water. Now here's another one where I can tell you that. Um, we're not sure that's where we need to be, but I can tell you that it is a very short article, so bold scanning will obviously be your friend on this one. So let's go on and jump over to this one and look here. So here we are in artificially uh, body, artificial 
are an artificially made bodies of water. Okay, so let's kind of go down. And really what we're looking for is doing what? Wiring methods permitted for feeder or brand circuit where flexibility is required. Okay, so you could go down here and you could go to each one of the sections and you see that here's wiring methods and installation. So we'll click on that right here. Okay. And let's see here. What do we got here? We got anything in here that's going to be beneficial to us? Okay. Let's see. Oh, went a little far. Right here. Okay. Liquid type 682. Again, now how could we have dissected this in the back of the code book? Well, obviously our triggers were, uh, well, we knew 682. Uh, we didn't confuse that with 680 swimming pools. Obviously not the same. Um, and you could have gone back into the book. Now, I'm not sure you'd have to. This is why I tell you, um, I get people again all the time that say, why do you why are you using the index like that? Why are you taking your time? Isn't it about speed? It is not about speed. If an instructor is telling you that, get a different instructor. Speed can be at the last two to three weeks, not when you're trying to learn the code. And if you're doing this on a budget, it means you're not in a program like ours or structured program, but you do have code questions dissect them things take your time because the process of dissecting it will help you learn the code and you'll get much better in the code okay all right so let's kind of go down and looks here okay and uh see what we got yeah i tried to to uh tried to mislead you a little earlier but i'm gonna i'm gonna pretend i didn't and not feel guilty about it so let's go and see first of all if there's anything under artificial bodies of water in the back of the index, there is artificially made bodies of water. So there is something in the index and I go look at it and it tells me to go to natural and artificial made bodies of water. So it's telling me that there is something under in for natural. So I'm gonna go to in. Now the reason I'm doing this is because now I'm gonna know what's in here. And if I get exam question, I will know exactly what natural bodies of water, naturally or artificially made bodies of water, what is actually available to me in the index? And, what, and, and whether or not I'm gonna waste my time going in there or not. So I'm here, I'm gonna look naturally and artificially made bodies of water. It tells me to go to 682, then it's got definitions, then it's got grounding and bonding, and then it's got part two, which is, uh, which is the installation. So that would have at least got us here and we could have started right here at part two, right? And then we would have bold scanned and we would have seen that the question was about the wiring methods. Okay, pretty straightforward. And as you can see here, liquid type flexible metal conduit or liquid type flexible non-metallic conduit, which again, wasn't one of our choices, with approved fitting shall be permitted for feeders and where flexibility connections are required for services. Extra hard usage, Portable power cable listed for both wet location and sunlight resistance shall be permitted for feeder or a brand circuit where flexibility is required. How about that? So when I told you the, the hard, extra hard usage portable power cable and tried to make you think because Article 400 says that cords cannot be used for permanent. This is a power cable. Okay, so did anybody go over there to 400, anything like that? Maybe, maybe, maybe not. Okay, TC cables, not traditional application, and there's so many limitations with 336. And USE cable, again, has limited applications as well. You have to follow what's, what's in that in 338. But specifically, it tells you what? <laughs> Look at camera says answer, none. All right, so it says in the code right here, extra hard usage portable power cable and if we go back to the question obviously the only other one in here and of course they don't say anything about lfnc in here but that is again that is acceptable for use as well so we're going to click this one see what we get there you go 682.13 and it was the same in the 2020 or 2017 code so very good, Swartzy. I would expect nothing less. All right. 
And oh, by the way, Swartzy, I did answer your question over in Fast Tracks chat, the personal message you sent. Uh, so go check that out if you haven't already seen it. I haven't been in the chat much today, so, uh, so, but it is over there. I did respond to you. All right, next, enclosures. All right, enclosures in a class one, division one. So we know it's class one, so we know it's flammable vapors, flammable gas, and all that. Okay, so class one and division one means it's present there all the time, whereas in two, it's only there under a rupture uh, or Something like that. So this is always present. So class one, division one, right? it's a location containing com components that are arc devices must have an approved conduit seal. So we're talking seals, okay? Located within blank inches of the enclosure or as required by the enclosure marking on each conduit run entering or leaving such enclosure. Okay, so we have this enclosure that could have a make or break component in there, switch or something, and creates an arc. Well, God, you know the last thing you want, you may need that switch, but the last thing you want is a class one division one location where the flammable vapors or gases will always be present. Last thing you want is something that creates an arc. That should be pretty, pretty common sense, right? So with that said, if it's got to be in there, then we have to put it in an enclosure that is designed for that, right? So where will we go find that information? Now, key triggers here. It's class one, division one. You have to know what class one is. Now, that's easy to find in the code book, whether you go to the table of contents or you actually go to the index. But we're going to use a code book Got your code book, and we're going to go and look under class one in hazardous locations. Now, you look under class one or look under hazardous locations and see which one of them helps you best. So you've got your code books, and you might already know this answer, and you might think, well, I'll just go to 501 and just start bolt scanning. Well, you could, but I do want to get you used to the index, okay? So let's see here. If I go into hazardous locations, and you'll see that it says hazardous classified locations class one. Okay, that's what we're doing. Um, and so I'm going to go down and look and see where it might say something about seals. Boom, 501.15. But do you also notice that it says 501.17? One of my things that I tell students all the time is if I'm back in the back of the code book and I'm already back here, one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to write down both of those. I'm going to write, as I'm back here, I'm going to write dot .15 and dot .17. And then, of course, I always write down the side 501. So I write 501. And then to the side of it, I write dot .15 and dot .17 because I don't want to have to come back. Now, I'm still here. So I'm going to also look at the one to the left of that in the index. It says hazardous classified locations, class one, two, three, division one and division two. And boldly look at it really quickly and see if it talks about seals. And it doesn't. It really is going to lead that to the classes. So I don't really need to go anywhere other than that. And so I'm going to go 501.15 first. And then I'm going to look. And I'm going to use the answers in the question. Remember, 18, 12, 30, and 24 to help me once I get there. So now we're going to go to the code. So let me go into the code. I'm doing great, by the way. And let's see. I'm going to go to 500.1. Remember, 500.1, class 1. 500.2, class 2. 500.503 is class 3. So 501, class 1. 502, class 2, 503, class 3. Should be pretty easy to remember those, right? So we'll go 501, think of 501, 1 is class 1. 502, 2 is class 2. You know, 503, 3, class 3. Should be easy to remember that. So I'm going to go to 501. And it said to go to 15, so I'm going to go to 15 first right here. Okay, so there's where I'm at. So this is your general information. It tells you to follow the rules in A through F. And I'm going to go down here. Now, this is where I'm going to use my answers, 18, 12, 30, and 24, to kind of hone in on where I need to be. So that way I'm not wasting myself on the other uh, fluff, right? 
So entering enclosures, I'm looking here and I'm trying to get really quickly, trying to see if I got, it. okay, so 18. Okay, so I have 18 inches right here, right? It says conduit seal shall be installed within 18 inches from the enclosures or as required by the enclosure markings, right? So I've got that. So boom, that's entering enclosures and that is class one, division one. But I'm going to keep that 18 and I'm going to just check. That's for two or more. Good news is that's still 18. Uh, this one down here, again, 18. This one, 36, is not going to make a difference for that one. And I'm looking here. Okay, so class one, division one boundary. So we're there. They're here too. And we're going to look down and see if there's anything that would change in the boundary. Okay. But we're actually talking about what? The enclosure. All right. And then it goes on to two. So we're, we're, we're back up here. So... We feel, very, feel pretty confident that it's 18 inches, right? Okay, let's go back to the code question. Good job. I see some people with code references in there. So we're going to go 18 inches. There it is, 501.15a1. We didn't even need to go to dot 17. Didn't need to. We found the answer at our first one, dot 15. So we dissected it out. We knew that this was class one, division one. And of course, the hazardous location stuff is well documented in the index. So you have no problem going to that and, and should be able to find it, whether it's a division one uh, or class one, class two or class three, well documented in the index. But I think you'll find that depending on the question, you, you can actually get used to 501 and go into 501 or 502 or 3. Now, I will tell you, if they ask you a question, just this little tip, if they ask you a question about the things that make up hazardous locations, like the different type of fuels, different types of chemicals, then that's going to be the generic 500, okay? And that would be, I'll just show you, I'll, I'll take you to that real quick. So this is the stuff that's going to be covered, because it's broadly covers the scopes of all the classified locations and their divisions. So here's where you'd go to get more information uh, on the different types of, of materials that are flammable and all this kind of stuff. So all that stuff's down in here, okay? Gives you the general information, right? But if you want to, in here, it gives you the different uh, groups, for example, of class one groups. Then here you got uh, acetylene, all that type of stuff. So. That's where you go if you want to get deep into the different groups and types and things like that, okay? But if you're going to find something specific like seals and the applications or boundaries and all that, then you go right to whatever um, article deals specifically with whatever class you're dealing with, class one, class two, or class three, okay? But the index is good for this one, and I'll tell you, the hazardous location stuff is broken out well in the index, better than just about most articles. Those are broken out very well in the index. So if you get some hazardous questions, people freak out about them all the time. The index does those very well, okay? So don't freak out about that. Another question. All right, ready? Y'all are doing great. I'm gonna let y'all answer this one now. Y'all lead me says, which of the following wiring methods are or is are approved for use for fixed wiring in an area above class one locations in a commercial repair garage? Okay. So which of the following wiring methods are or is or is or are approved for use for fixed wiring in an area above a class one location in a commercial repair garage? All of these are approved for such locations. MC cable, AC cable, MI cable. Okay. Somebody help me out. First of all, if I'm dissecting this one, um, I know that we're talking about a specific location. And we know that there's a code article for it because it's asking about commercial repair garages. So that should give you the first hint on what article you need to be in. Okay. So I will go there, see if you find the answer and post it in the chat. And I will go there as well. And see if, if any of you can find it. 
Oops, I went too far. Is okay. Nobody's posted anything, so either I'm on a delay and my camera's not good and doing near as good as I thought it was, and the stream is getting weaker. Who knows? But all right, here we go. So you have what's called commercial garages repair and storage, right? 511, right? And you have minor and a major. Okay, so this just says commercial repair garage. So the question, if you remember the question, is fixed wiring above the classified location. Okay, so let's see if we can go down. And here's a minor. All right, and let's see here what we can find in here. All right, wiring locations. Okay, so wiring locations. So it's asking about fixed wiring. Within class one locations, that's classified 511.3, wiring shall conform to applicable provisions of Article 501. Okay. And this is equipment that's located in it. Okay. Let's see what else we might hear. Oh, check this out. Anybody give me something? Okay, 511. I got that. Schwartz is on 11. Now, this is, says wiring and equipment installed above class one locations. I don't know. That sounded just like our question, didn't it? It's above. There you go. Schwartz, he's throwing out the code references now. So we go down here. Wiring in spaces above that. Now I'm just waiting for Schwartz to give me the answer because he's giving me everything else. Let's see if he can give me the answer. Now, here's what it says. All fixed wiring above class one locations shall be in metal raceways, rigid, non-metallic conduit, okay? It's a uh, rigid non-metallic is PVC. Um, electrical non-metallic tubing, ENT. Uh, flexible metal conduit, FMC. Liquitite flexible metal conduit, yeah. Liquitite flexible non-metallic conduit, okay. Or shall be type MC or AC or MI, okay. That's a lot, okay. So let's go back to the question. I think, I don't know if I was on the code. Where was I at? Was I on the question or was I on the code? So anyway, here's where, here's where we needed to be. Sorry, I don't know if I showed this or not. So here's 511.7. Notice that it says where? Wiring in spaces above class one locations, just like what was in our question. Here, fixed wiring above a class one location, just like what was in our question. And you'll notice that MC, AC, and MI are one of the wiring methods, or three there, but they're all permitted above there, okay? So MC, AC, and MI are perfectly acceptable as fixed wiring above a class one location. So that takes us back to our question. And obviously, all of these are allowed to be above. And there you go, 511 511.7. A1, and it was the same for the 2017 as it is for the 2020 code. All the same, okay? Um, another way that you could have probably found this is if we go back to the index, and let's see, of the question, we're looking for commercial repair garage. So I might look under C to see if there's anything under commercial repair garage, just to see. And mm -hmm. we have I don't I don't say there it is commercial garages it says C garages okay so kind of helps you okay. Multitask. <laughs> Michael's multitasking. It's always multitasking. All right. So we go look under garages. And let's just see what's under garages. See if it would help us. And that's important, right? Because now you know with the index, if you get a, co a question talking about garages or repair garages, that you now know that the index has something under garages, not commercial garages, just just under garages. So let's see what we might have under. So let's go and see what's under garages. 
All right, garages, and you'll notice commercial. So that's what we, it's what our question was, commercial repair garage, so commercial. So let's see here, and as we kind of go down, we'll see what we've got. And you'll see, okay, well, classification of locations. Uh, let's see here, if you go down, is there anything? Wiring, okay, the question is asking about fixed wiring, so if you look in the index, and you look under garages, and you look commercial garages, which also gives you the articles. So if you happen to be struggling with that, you knew that it was 511. And then you go down and you, if the question is talking about wiring, fixed wiring, and it actually says wiring, and it's 511.4 and 511.17. So what do you do? You write dot four down and you write dot seven down. And you would have hit dot four, it wouldn't have helped you. Then you would have gone right to dot seven. Bold scanning along the way, okay? That's important, okay? So that's how you would have got, one way you would have used the index to be able to do that. Now, if you already knew the question and you knew the answer, then that's great. You just mark it, you go on. Uh, but, you know, this wasn't, a, this wasn't a change for whether it's 2017 or 2020. So, very good. All right, you ready? All right, next question. Where an office building has a 208Y120 volt three-phase service with a balanced net computed load of 90 kVA, so it's 90,000 VA, what is the approximate current each ungrounded phase conductor carries at full load, okay? So if it's 90,000, right? So what do you think? How would you solve this one? So it's 90,000 VA and it's three phase. What do you think it's, what do you think it does? How many amps do you think? So it's 90,000, so it is three phase, right? So I would do 90,000. Remember it says it's balanced by the way, All right? 90,000 and what are you doing that? It's three phase, okay, divided by, see what, see what y'all think it would be. Anybody got any answers? You don't need to code for this one. How about that? This is going to be like a general knowledge type question. And if you get it wrong, don't worry. We'll dissect it out. But let's see some answers. Okay, so I got a 750 amperes. Okay. Anybody else? Remember, it says a balanced net computed load. Got another 750. And I got a 250. Schwartz has got 250. Okay. Couple more come in, and now one more or so. Somebody else give me another another one, and we'll go on and answer this one. Anybody else out there watching? Come on now, don't be shy, folks. It doesn't matter whether you're right or you're wrong. When we do these trainings, we leave that ego at the door. We're simply here to learn code, and it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, you're going to learn either way. We're going to be able to get the answer down, okay? So nobody else wants to chime in on it? We've got seven people out there and in, in, uh, watching. Again, not a big stream tonight, okay? So, all right, well, we'll answer. So Schwartzy says it's 250. Um, the others say it's 750, okay? So tell you what, Schwartzy, we're going to choose their 750, and then we'll just, we'll just see if the Swartz will be with us. So there is pick 750, and I'll go bump, bump, bump. Swartz is absolutely right. Remember, folks, it said balanced. Balanced. So basically, it's 90,000. You can do 90 kVA. Y'all know what the K means. And you divide that by 360.25. Okay? Remember, it's three phase. So you're going to be dividing it by 280 times the square root of three. Right, and that's where that 360.25 comes from. Okay, if you want to round it to 360.26, it's not going to change your answer. Okay, and so at the end of the day, it's going to end up bumping up. Okay, so if you did that, you did 90,000, right, and you divided that by 360.25, that is going to be 249.82. Remember, 0.5 or greater, you're going to round up. So that's where you get 250. The key to that question was that it said it was a balanced 
three-phase system. Okay, so there you go. That's a general knowledge question. It's not a code question. It's just it's trying to see if you understand Ohm's law and to do these different calculations. Good news on most of the exams, you're going to actually get a chart or Ohm's wheel or something with you. But you do got to remember that it's three phase. You do can remember that if this had been single phase, 120240, it just would have been 90,000 divided by 240. But it was three phase. Okay. So there you go. So good job, Swartzy. I knew you had it in you. But this is why our program is so important for people that really struggle, because we will give you the answers. And of course, I grade all the competency reviews personally. So, um, but if you're interested in the Fast Tracks program, it's, the website's right there, and you can go watch a demo, and you can see all the stuff. Um, any of our students can attest to the Fast Tracks program. It's not easy, but uh, it will definitely help you learn the NEC, that's for sure. All right. Doing great. Next question. When a raceway is run through the wall from the interior to the exterior of the building, the raceway shall blank. Okay, so it's running from the interior to the exterior. Be sealed with an approved material. Be rigid metal RMC. Have an explosion proof fitting, a seal. Or be, be rigid polyvinyl chloride conduit PVC. Okay, so when you look at a question like this, a couple of them you can just throw right out. There is no freaking way you need an explosion proof seal. So this is another thing that I'll use when an exam is throwing out the obvious. It's going to increase your odds. So right now you have a 25% chance of getting it right, right? If you get rid of the explosion proof seal, now you have a 33.3% chance of getting it right. You're narrowing it down. Now, one of the other things you could look at, and we're going to do this one without even looking it up, but then we'll look it up. But I want to do this de deductive reasoning. Next, are we sure that anything in the code says that it's got to be rigid or it's got to be PVC, right? So I think you can look at this and go, I think it can be either one I want it to be. If I'm going from interior, exterior, how many of you ran PVC through the wall? My, uh, Michael, I'm sure you have. But how many of you run rigid through the wall? I'm sure a lot of you have. So I think what we're focused on is the change between the outside and inside and making sure that moisture and things can't get from the ins outside inside, right? So if we were to just do a deductive logic on this question, and that's what you can do on an exam, if you can break it down, is we'll choose that. And we know we're correct. Now see this 300? That is your wiring requirements, okay? That's your general requirements. So we're gonna go to 307A to show you that. So here's 300. We used normal reasoning to solve that one. And so here's uh, 300. It's the, we go to it, the general requirements for wiring methods and materials. And you could have found this in the back of the book by simply going to, um, let's see here, probably, mm, I'm not going to say through the wall. I don't think that's a one in the back of the book. Um, not really sure how you would cross reference this one in the back. I guess wiring methods. Maybe you look under wiring methods. And it would give you something like that. Or maybe you look in, uh, in the back under uh, mm, not sure. Some of these things, the index is not going to help you. I'm sure there's something back there that gets you. You know, temperature, um, expanding, contracting maybe now. Um, this is one of those ones where you just have to look at it and go, this is, a, this is kind of an installation thing. And that's what would be under 300. Right, because that's where we get depth of cover, 300.5, all those kind of re general requirements for installations. And here we're talking about what you need to do as it leaves the interior to exterior. So again, that's something that would be in a 300 type of thing. Uh, it's important to realize that the index is not the holy grail. Okay, it's not the holy grail. It can be important, but it's not going to be. You can't if you have to go look up every question in the back of the book, you're going to struggle. 
So that's why our course kind of teaches you these things so that you don't have to look up every question. And you seem to retain it a lot better. All right, 300.7, scrolling through right here. Raceway is exposed to different temperatures. Okay, so ceiling right here. There you go. So it says A, ceiling. It says where the portions of raceway or sleeve are known to be subjected to different temperatures and where condensation uh, is known to be a problem, such as in a cold storage areas of buildings or we're passing through the interior to the exterior of a building, the raceway or sleeve shall be sealed to prevent the circulation of warm air to the cold section of the raceway, which would then cause condensation and water leaking in through that way. So there you go. That's where it's sealed. And um, the other thing about this is when you do the sealing, you can use stuff like a duct seal, uh, but there are other products that do that. Polywater makes some great products for sealing. Okay, so Polywater can do that as well. Um, but definitely you have to seal it. And when something is to be approved, or in our question, when it talked about something to be approved, that's just something that the AHJ is okay with, right? That's what the approval really means. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see here. Let's go to another question. Y'all are kicking it now. You're just kind of kicking along. Ready? All right. Next one. Class two. Now, here's one where you can get it. Boom. Get it and move. Class two locations are those that are hazardous classified uh, because of the presence of combustible dust, ignitable fibers, flammable gas, ignitable vapors. Okay, folks, y'all know class one is combustible what? Gas and vapors and liquids, right? So deductive reasoning again here. If you already, if you know what class one is and you can look at this one and go, okay, well, I know it's not flammable gas. I know it's not ignitable vapors. Okay, so those two are off the table. It's either combustible dust or ignitable fibers. Well, class two is combustible dust. Class three is ignitable fibers and flyings, okay? Like in coke plants or a pulp mill or something like that. But the combustible dust is class two. So class one, ignitable vapors, flammable gas and liquids. Class two is combustible dust. Class three is ignitable fibers and flyings, that type of thing. Okay. So easy to start trying to remember those things that way. And then again, you don't have to go look it up. But now if you did want to go look it up and you weren't sure what class two is, and that's so easy, you know, to go to 502. And it makes it simple. So if I didn't know that, I'm just saying if you didn't, um, I would and you I just go to 502. Of course, you could also go to 500 and that gives a general overview as well. So you would be able to find it in either or. But let's just go to 500. I mean, 502, uh, 502 real quick. If you happen to hit it, room right here and you'll see right here. Combustible dust right there. Scope It's what 502 is about. Okay. Now, also to show you this, if the 500, I'll go to 500 as well. And you're into 500 and you'll go down and you just have to, you'd have to scroll down a little bit in order to start seeing there's class one, right? And then you get the class two. And again, it'll show you combustible dust again, right? And then if you're wondering what class three is, you go down a little further and here's class three. And it'll tell you again that it's that it is ignitable fibers and flyings. OK, pretty straightforward. Also, remember that class one, division one, division one is more restrictive than division two. OK, so equipment that is OK for division one can be used in division two. Things that are rated for class one, division two cannot be used in class one. Why? Class two, it's only exposed if there's a rupture or a breakdown. OK, class one is where it's potentially present all the time. So it's more restrictive. So remember that. And you will have seals when you go from one classification to another. OK, all right. Anyway, uh, and we are going to have some videos on that. If you're a hazardous location freak and you really want to have that stuff, 
we are going to be doing that for the 2023. We're going to be getting into hazardous classified locations even more. So let's get back to our code question. And we've kind of deductive reasoned this thing to death. And we know that class two is combustible dust. And there you go. And notice this one uses 500.5C. So you could have done, and that's the beautiful thing about the code. Sometimes you can find the answer in multiple locations. Okay. Now, in our Fast Tracks program, we want you to give a code reference, but if you leave it blank, we're going to mark it wrong, even if you get the question right. Because we at least want, and we're not so focused on you getting the section perfect, but we want to make sure you're in the right area to go along with your answer. Otherwise, what's the point, right? That's what our program's designed to do. Okay. Um, one more question, and we'll call it a night for you folks. All right. All right. Let's look at this one. See if, we ended on, see if we ended on a doozy. Here's a given. A size 14 AWG brand circuit conductor protected, okay, listen, folks, by a 15 ampere rated circuit breaker is to supply, you ready? Three 20 amp rated duplex receptacles. This brand circuit is a would be in compliance with the NEC if the wire was size 12. B, is in compliance with the NEC. C, is not in compliance with the NEC because the receptacle outlets have a 20 amp rating, and I would say it's receptacle devices have a 20 amp rating. And number four, would be compliant with the NEC if the circuit breaker was rated at 20 amperes. So what do you think? A, B, C, or D? What do you think? Now remember, remember, it's a 15 amp brand circuit, okay? So I'm, so I'm putting the 15 amp circuit breaker on it, and I'm using 14 gauge wire. So it's a 15 amp circuit breaker, 14 gauge wire, and I'm putting three 20 amp rated duplexes on it now think about that for a second in a kit in a, in a uh he's got all right, all right so we have one answer okay we have one answer we have one answer and let's see if anybody else gives us an answer but think about this and you'll probably know where we got to go in the code because it's talking about the branch circuit and everything that's being placed on it the question saying the branch circuit so we know it's a brand circuit, so we know what article to be in. But you know that in a, it's very common in a kitchen to have a 20 amp brand circuit and put 15 amp rated devices on it, right? Pretty common. And of course, put 20 amp rated devices on it. However, having a 15 amp brand circuit, putting 20 amp rated devices on it would give the impression to folks that you'd get 20 amps out of it. The devices look different. So what do you think? I got one answer here. Let's see if anybody else has an answer. How about a code reference? How about that, uh, Fabrice? Uh, if, I, if I agree with your answer, tell me where you find it. And don't just say impacity table because that wouldn't be accurate. Tell me where exactly would you find that answer? And I will go there in, while I'm waiting for some people to answer. This is, this is for you folks. But I'm going to go there. Remember, I'll give you one hint. It's obviously in uh, 210 because it's a branch circuit question. And tell me, where, tell me where to go. And I'll go there and wait for some people to, to see if they got any answers coming up. And in the future, when I do some of these, I probably will put uh, maybe a timer on the screen. Or something like that. Something to you know, help people maybe get to the, get, you know, kind of, it's kind of put the sense of urgency in there. Okay, we got 210.24, okay. The branch circuit requirements it might be more places than than just that but we'll go with that and see what else okay we got we have a now well, we have a table 210.21 b2 okay so michael give me your answer 
A, B, C, or D, and then we'll go look up because I've got I've got Fabrice's answer, and he says C. So you give me your answer, and then we'll go and we'll go look. I haven't seen your answer. I haven't seen the answer yet. Okay. Okay, there we go. All right, so now let's go. Let's go and go on and answer it. And everybody agrees that it's C. There you go. 210.24 is the answer. Now... You can also get this answer is well kind of backwards around, and I'll show you where you could get this answer in a couple different ways. Um, so let's go to the code real quick. Well, first we'll acknowledge the answer in 210.24 first, okay? And so 210.24 is this table, right? So it says the requirements for circuits that have two or more outlets and a duplex is two, but this happens to say, I believe the question says there was three 20 amp duplex receptacles. Um, so that's actually one, two, three, four, six receptacles, by the way. Uh, duplex is two receptacles. Um, where it says two or more outlets or receptacles other than receptacle circuits in those, yada, 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 that's just the requirements, uh, are summarized in table 210.24, okay? So if you look at this table first, and it kind of can't see the whole table, but I'll tell you that this right here is your 15 amp circuit, and it says the circuit wires, okay, 14, all right? So in our case, the 14, all right? Now it goes down here to the receptacle rating, okay, which is right here. I know you can't see it, but it's right here to the left of where my mouse is. It says 15 amp max, okay? So that's the receptacle rating, okay? That would be 15 amp max. Now, where else will we see that? Okay, well, let's do go back up here where some of the references that were made. So receptacle ratings, you can get there kind of backwards by looking at this one right here. And you can see, well, if the receptacle is rated 20 or 15, and I was kind of talking about that in kitchens, for example, on a 20 amp circuit, here's a 20 amp circuit, so it can be a 15 or a 20, but you'll notice that if the receptacle rating is 15, then it has to be on a 15 amp brand circuit. So since we had a 14 gauge, 15 amp brand circuit protection, then the receptacle, again, couldn't be rated higher than 15 amps. So that's another way, and that is 210.21B3. And then these um, B2 right here, this is more specifically for, kind of still can get there, but the receptacle ratings for 15 or 20, okay, can be a 15, so that kind of matches the other one. But this is more about cord and plug connected loads. And that really wasn't our, our really about our question, okay? But deductive reasoning would have told you that obviously a 20 can only be on a 20. And our question was a 15, but the receptacle rating could only be 15. So backwards, either way you go, you would have gotten 15 amps. And so the answer would have been it's not compliant, okay? All right, so... Hopefully you got something out of that. Just a little something. We'll do more of these. Uh, and I have a whole new set of database of questions that we'll be using in the future. I want to remind you folks, if you happen to be on TikTok, check out Jay Grunberg. He loves doing that TikTok thing. And he's got a great little course that he does or a little uh, Q&A that he does. He gets real excited about it. And people all, he gets a lot of people that chime in on that. So again, just another opportunity to learn the code. Okay. So make sure you do check out Jay's thing over there on TikTok. Uh, and uh, it's uh, Basement King 12. Uh, but I think if you just search for Gr Jay Grunberg, you'll be able to find it. And make sure you follow him and make sure that you check out one of his code nights where he does code questions and things like that. You'll, you'll have a good time with it. 
All right, folks, 2023 Fast Tracks is coming out soon. If you want information on our Fast Tracks program or get into a structured program, right here below you see the website, FastTracksystem.com. Go there, check it out. We have a free course up there, by the way. We have boxes and enclosures. It's a freebie. And we also have an exam prep primer up there that does give you 10 tough quiz questions. See how good you do, because if you do good, you get a certificate. And I'd love to see you posting those certificates on social media. Let people know that you actually passed the quiz. It's awesome, right? And we're going to have more quizzes on our website in the future. So, all right, folks, that's it. Hopefully you got something out of it. Enjoyed it tonight. Thanks for joining me on the stream. It's a rare that I do a Friday night stream, which means I probably wasn't going to the lake, uh, the lake this weekend, right? No, because I got a lot of videos I got to crank out. So till next time, folks, stay safe. God bless and hope you got something out of it.